Hi, welcome to Holding Space. I'm Caleb Mayo, and this is my brother, John Mayo. What's up? UFOs are real, and we're going to talk about it. Yeah, so today we're going to explore why UFOs are kind of careful, and I'm going to throw to John to set up this idea. So, yeah, we're fascinated by why it is that UFOs uh, <laughs> appear seem to, like, curtail their behaviors to some extent. It seems like... I guess I guess the crux is kind of that it seems like if they wanted to, they could be not seen at all by us. And instead, we see them quite a lot. Uh, so I guess maybe the way to, to start is for us to just like define what do we mean by being careful um, or kind of careful. Um, you got any that come to mind for you? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say on the other half of that sandwich, it seems yeah. like if they wanted to, they could very easily display themselves super publicly right yes yeah okay so that's all right so that's part of it we don't see for instance a lot of mass sightings there there are uh you know tons and tons of sightings probably every day somewhere but it's been since i don't know arguably like tinley park chicago area 2006 and before that, like Phoenix Lights in 1997, those are kind of, I think, the last times, I know there's both America, but those are the last times that like thousands of people saw um, saw some UFOs. Was Tinley Park the Chicago O'Hare airport appearance? No, oh, and it's 2004. Um, okay. It's uh, in, in August and through October of 2004. Um, it's not the, it's not the O'Hare airport, though I think that was 2000, Four maybe also so maybe, i think maybe oh six but that's like, just my memory okay, yeah right. no you're right that's oh six okay so oh four halloween night in particular uh in 2004 in tinley park which is a suburb south of chicago thousands of people saw these red lights in the sky and their videotapes about it if you look it up on youtube you'll find documentaries people have made about it there are newspaper articles about it um many many people uh i always think it's worth contextualizing that the uh, the iPhone came out in, I think, 2006 uh, also. So mm -hmm. in the smartphone era, we really have not had one of these mass sightings. The Phoenix mm -hmm. Light in 1997, also thousands of people saw these ships um, over over uh, this, this one evening um, in March, uh, flying like enormous triangles, flying low and totally silent over, you know, so that's one thing. We don't see a ton of mass sightings. We don't see uh, we don't see like a DC nineteen fifty two style sighting over a major city. Also, yeah, um, yeah, and and yet on the other side, we don't never see them. Like thousands of people see some kind of UFO every year. Pilots are seeing these things all the time. Uh, Graves, in his testimony to Congress, says, uh, and his 60 Minutes interview says, pilots see this every day, or at least for several years while he was working in the Air Force, they saw these things every day. So it, it's like a fairly common experience, but it's not so common as to happen over Times Square or have yet featured the famous White House lawn moment. Right. Okay. And that seems deliberate. Yes. All right. So those are the those are kind of the two sides that we're coming at. The the two like assumptions that we're walking into into this conversation with is uh, is one that they they seem to be uh, they seem to not want to fully show themselves to us, and two, they seem to be capable of doing so if they if they did want to. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so that leads to leads to this like fascinating question, which is why why would you not be totally sneaky or totally demonstrative why would you weave this line in the middle so we've got a bunch of potential interesting answers for that and we think that maybe these are going to collapse into some big buckets as we go through them but we're going to take them one by one and see what kind of categories they inspire and then maybe at the end we'll look back and see what kind of big chunks they may have formed does that sound good to you yeah i think that sounds good um, okay. Okay, cool. Let's start with, I'm going to start with one that I don't think is super uh, plausible, um, which is that they may just not care. Maybe they're truly disinterested in whether or not we see them. 
and that could be because they're so much more powerful than us. That could be because we are, yeah, I mean, because we're we're ants to them. It could be because, you know, we're maybe not that interesting and like they're all over the cosmos and, and Earth is just not that cool. Um, what do you think of that idea? Yeah, I agree with you that it seems lower probability because that would imply that it's random that they're not appearing above dense population centers frequently. Um, and that that doesn't seem right to me. Um, I, I saw actually like uh, an Axios report, I'll find this link, that said that uh, the arrow sighting collation recently suggests that in the west of the United States, these sightings are happening disproportionately in areas of dark sky, which is like places with low light pollution. Uh, so it seems like we have not just anecdotal, but maybe the beginning of some like sensor and like tabulation data that suggests that more of this activity happens far away from big human centers. So I think it's it's unlikely that they are that we're seeing the result of them just not caring because if they really didn't care, they would be zipping around like every now and then we would see one over New York or, you know, Taipei or like what uh, like big places with lots of people. And that would just like be a much more common experience, especially in, in the cell phone era, which, as you point out, has been largely devoid of these mass sightings. So I think they they are not. Uh, interested in us is not a good explanation, but it does come up on the list. So I appreciate you starting with it. Cool. Okay, great. Let's let's move on then. Um, you do the next one. Okay. Uh, this is one I like. I think they may be slightly concerned about us. Um, and the analogy that I've been using is like, if you're on safari or if you were to like drive by a like a group of humans who are still living in the wild um and have like sort of early technology like spears and sticks um you might not be super afraid of them but you might not be not at all afraid of them <laughs> like you're in your subaru your subaru is much more advanced technology you could drive away at any time but if somebody threw a spear through your subaru window you could still die <laughs> no yes, you might will. Do still get their faces eaten off by lions every now and then on safari. Yeah, right. And maybe um, there's an analogy there to occasional UFO shoot downs, which we hear mumblings about, but we don't know for sure is a thing that happens. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of buy this idea that they might be slightly concerned and just being careful. What do you think about that? I think there's some supporting evidence for it also. Like, for instance, uh, I mean, for instance, their their fascination with our nuclear weapons, our apparent interest interest in our nuclear weapons and nuclear facilities, um, and then also arguably maybe like the way they interact with um, with our like fighter jets and fighter pilots. Uh, for instance, like the Iran the Tehran encounter in 1976, where the guy engages his weapon system and then it like shuts down. Um, or the even the Fravor Nimitz Tic Tac encounter, where uh, you know he goes down to start to engage with it, the thing starts coming up and then just like blasts away. Doesn't want to stick around for too long. Um, what do you think? I feel like there's other like corollary evidence here for for them being slightly concerned of us. Uh, that they tend to jet when we follow them, like if there are jets scrambled they tend to boogie after not too long um there's that i was thinking about that the big crazy diamond in scotland was like apparently circled by some military jets and then eventually it just bounced um okay cool uh this is this is making me think of another one which is the idea that maybe they're um behaving sort of playfully with mm. us maybe they're toying with us mm. in a way and the yeah the the not being careful or being kind of careful is um is a game Ooh, i really like this idea can i do my uh call of the wild thing here yeah absolutely oh, okay cool so there's this section in call of the wild toward the end where buck's kind of like exploring the wilderness more and he meets a wolf and this 
uh, Gray Wolf is like nothing he's ever seen before because he's grown up with dogs and been working with dogs. And he's like a hardened warrior now because he's been through fights and races, but he's never encountered a wolf. And so the wolf like appears to him in a, a clearing and Buck uh, follows it. And the wolf basically plays this game with him where it runs away until Buck can corner it. And then it runs away again and then Buck corners it again and it runs away one more time and Buck really locks it in to this like place that it can't escape from. And at that point, the wolf's demeanor changes and he sort of accepts Buck as a peer and leads him on a journey through the forest to like where the wolf lives. And uh, their dynamic kind of shifts completely. (laughs) I really like this story because that makes me think of the way the Tic Tac behaves. It comes right up to Fravor, and then it blasts off Fravor and Dietrich, excuse me. And and it doesn't just fly away, it flies to their cap point, which is like a relevant place in their mission. And, and that sort of suggests that it's saying, can you do this? Can you follow me? And maybe it's inviting us to move along at its speed. Um, and so this kind of gets to another big bucket, as as you were saying, of potential ideas here, which is that they're like drawing us out, that they're like, they're being slightly careful because they don't, they don't want to just like flatly interact with us. And maybe we'll get to a reason for that in a minute. Um, But they're, they're not avoiding us completely because they want to engage a little bit. How does that land for you? I, I mean, I like it. It's a fun one. It's a, it's a hopeful one, I think also. Um, and we have a few hopeful ones on this list and, and <laughs> a couple scary ones. Um, well, do you want to, do you want to, do you yeah. want to assign a, uh, do you want to assign a number to each of these of how likely we think it is like a one to three sure. or a one to five score? One. Yeah, sure. I'll give, they may not care a one out of five. Agree. Agree. Uh, slightly concerned about maybe like a four. What do you think? A four out of five, ah, man. I don't know. Three? It's tempered. My my thinking on this is tempered by the fact that they appear to be so far advanced that I think we mm. might be passing ourselves up to think that they're <laughs> even a little scared of us. Maybe scared of us destroying our planet, but I don't know uh-huh. that they're scared of us. Okay, so maybe that's a two or three. Yeah, let's call it a let's call it a three because they are really interested in our our weaponry. Okay, um, and then playfulness. I mean. I gotta say, I, some of these encounters I think really do exhibit this. It just sort of feels like that to me. Mm, like mimicking human behavior, responding to human thought, maybe. Oh, another, I think another corollary for the playful behavior is when people, there are numerous examples of this. Um, specific ones I'm thinking of are in Belgium in 88 and in the New York Hudson, Hudson Valley wave shortly after that. Um, when people flash their car headlights at the craft or a flashlight, the craft flashed their lights back, which is arguably contact, I think. Um, yeah. But feels like it's like a you hello. <laughs> wink, wink. Yeah. So I would give a four to Playful. Cool. Ooh, I want that one to be true so bad. Okay, why don't you pick another one? Okay, um, well, this is a little more prosaic, uh, so maybe it should have gone closer to the top, but maybe they have rules. Um, and uh, this, you know, is often called the, like, Star Trek principle, what's it called, the, like, first contact idea. Oh, it's like best case scenario is that there's a Starfleet and they have rules and that we're, that we're like, we're in the early stages of some onboarding program to a sick-ass club and we're going to get, like, silver zip-up jumpsuits and, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, you're right. That would be freaking awesome. Uh, and one way I think about this is that maybe Earth is in somebody's territory. For some reason, I think of this as like the France theory. Like maybe we live in France and we don't know that we live in France. And like Earth is part of a like a region controlled by one species or a group of aliens. Um, and yeah, maybe so they have the uncontacted tribes of Burgundy. <laughs> Right. So so what that would do is explain the variation uh, and the uniform behavior. Like there are lots of different kinds of UFOs and there are lots of different kinds of beings people have reported seeing. Um, so either 
all of those beings have similar instincts about how to be careful when interacting with a new species, or there's some kind of rule set that they're operating under, which wouldn't have to imply that there was a regional governor, uh, but it could it could imply that. It could also imply that there's like a much larger legal agreement throughout the galaxy. Yeah. Okay. That is that is great, and I I. And this is a, this is like a meaty one, I think. This this they may have rules ideas, and I want to just like repeat that back to you and try to maybe dig in on it a little bit because I think it's really really interesting. The idea Great. that either there there are rules because there's so many different, there's so much variety in the sightings of both creatures and uh, and craft that either they're working under some rule book on some some superstructure governing organization, or and this is the more interesting one. They innately uh something in evolution how you know intelligent species evolve that and they all have reached the same conclusion about how they should interact with us mm -hmm. and that it's that it's natural that's i find that idea really fascinating and again again hopeful i think like it's sort of like the opposite of a great filter you know like of a doomsday kind of scenario mm -hmm. about evolution it actually implies that like the more evolved and intelligent you get the like the kinder and more sensitive and nurturing civilizations become. That to me is is just like super, super hopeful. I love that one. Yeah, that pivots into an adjacent idea really nicely, which is that they're being careful because they don't want to freak us out, that they're empathetic and looking out for our feels. Uh, and they're not appearing above New York because they don't want to cause mass panic. Maybe, as you say, they're so far advanced that they're not even that worried that we might attack them. They're just more worried that it would like disturb our civilization uh, in, in a dangerous way. Yeah, well, so, okay, so I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but how does that, how do you think that interacts with the like, you know, the glut of pretty disturbing abduction stories that people share? Well, that I think points to another potential explanation along these lines of the non-interference principle, which is that we have a scientific relationship that they're observing us and being careful in the way that we're careful when we observe wild populations mm -hmm. like we'll go out and watch a bunch of monkeys do something and we'll keep our distance but we can't necessarily hide completely if we want to engage with these monkeys um and mm -hmm. the whitley streeper pointed out uh, recently on the rabbit hole podcast which is great uh that uh humans sometimes abduct animals and like artificially inseminate them and uh there might there are like lady rhinoceri out there who are like missing time and got taken and got you know injected with rhinoceros semen and they don't understand why and from our point of view that's like a positive contribution to rhino rhinoceros society but from her point of view it's you know traumatic and terrifying so it could be that some of these abductions or all of the all of our most of them are essentially scientific in nature or preservational in nature yeah and right. uh, white, this is white rhinos don't know that they're nearly extinct and that doesn't Im it implies some not great <laughs> potential future outcomes for humans but like it's pretty easy to argue that humans are uh on the brink of extinction um, right and for one thing we only live on this planet um and we should maybe yeah. note that there are some offshoots of this that are sort of like darker or bigger, which involve the aliens like controlling or whatever the phenomenon, the beings, some beings controlling human evolution in some way or like guiding our growth and change throughout maybe millennia or million Um but it could it could be as simple as just like observational science, or it could be as serious as like direct management, and that that's just pinging two sort of branches of that yeah. possibility. Okay, let's let's assign a rating to this rules idea and then move on. Um, I don't I don't think it makes sense to separate them because we're I mean we're already in speculation territory pretty heavily here, but like I don't know it's we, we yeah speculating about a governing structure seems out of scope um i would say this is a five i think they clearly are adhering to some guidelines here whether written or organic it really feels to me like they're 
they have some they have some rules. But what do you what do you think? What, either written or organic. So you would give those the same probability that they have like naturally arrived at this behavior versus that they have like collectively agreed. I guess what I'm saying is like I don't know how to I don't know how to separate the two or like like I'd kind of rather just assign a, a number to the whole general idea. What I don't know. What do you okay, think? Okay, yeah. No, Most that works for me. And I, I think given how much territory it's covering, it makes sense to give it a five. It's pretty darn likely that they're doing this on purpose uh, because it's it's just too persistent and widespread a behavior for it to be an accident. Would you assign different likeliness quotients to innate versus governed? I guess I sort of would tend to think that the innate is a little more likely. Um, just partially based on the diversity of uh, UFO and possibly beings, uh, that sort of suggests to me that uh, it it might be difficult to get that many different kinds of creatures to agree. Um, I also actually wanted to flag something in this space, which is that it's possible that most of these beings have agreed to something, but some haven't. Uh, and so that could be a potential explanation for some of the outlying examples like O'Hare Airport or um, the Phoenix Lights or something like maybe every now and then somebody shows up who's not playing by the rules, um, who hasn't bought into the Federation's um, guidelines and or who has just like different instincts about how to interact with lower species. Um, OK, so what number do you want to give to this one? Uh, wh which one? Rules or natural? Just rule. Well, uh, I, if you want to split them up, give me different numbers. I like it. I would say five natural, four rules. Okay. All right. Cool. Great. I'm cool with both of those. Um, I feel like we we sort of moved into talking about the um, the control experiment idea that they're mm. carefully controlling us and they don't want to mess with their experiment. <laughs> Um, mm. what, can you expand on that a little? Okay. So I was going to mention this at the end, but I heard a tidbit recently from, uh, a Martin Willis interview with, of all people, Garrett Graff, who's like the wrong guy to bring up something that's crazy to, um, but basically Martin Willis says he was talking to a friend who served in Vietnam and this guy said his job in Vietnam was basically UFO chasing that like UFOs used to pop up during like napalm raids and stuff. And uh, so this guy was like part of the military service that responded to these UFO appearances in Vietnam. And uh, Martin Willis said, so what are they doing? Like, What's the deal? Why are they here? And uh, the guy said, uh, we're a Petri dish. And that's all he would say about the subject. Um, but Martin Willis's takeaway from that was that we are some kind of experiment or the earth ecosystem is a managed garden in some way. And there, there are some other kind of far fetched data points. You, you could maybe generously say that sort of point in this direction. Um, but I will, I will say that it feels crazy. This like feels intuitively unlikely. I personally have a little bit of a hard time peeling apart how how much it feels unlikely and how much I just don't want it to be true. I think this is a place where like human ego sort of clouds our judgment. It's a little difficult for me to see clearly um, how how likely I think it is because I really don't want it to be the case. What it also makes me wonder right away is are we seeing a ramp up in activity? over the past 100 years or so or 85 years or are we just getting better at spotting these things yeah if, if it's been consistent over millennia that to me feels like more of an argument for us being a petri dish um but i guess also maybe we're just the, the counter argument would be that things are like coming to a head right now and the petri dish is getting really really interesting because the petri dish has nuclear weapons and mm -hmm. 
artificial intelligence now. So maybe yeah, so they would monitoring us, yeah, more closely. Yeah, taking more of a hands-on approach. I don't know. Do you have a, a gut instinct about the one to five on this? Oof. That they're controlling us and don't want to mess with their experiment. Man, I don't. I agree. It's so hard to assign a likeliness quotient to this because I so don't want it to be true. And it's also so ontologically it doesn't fit with my worldview and everything that I <laughs> have been raised up believing about the world. I don't mm -hmm. know. Three? <laughs> yeah, three about? over two, maybe. Like, we want to give it a two, but yeah. realistically, we think maybe there's something to it. So, yeah, probably might be a three. I'm human, and I don't want it to be true. Yeah. God. I, man, I think a lot about that that thing from Communion, Whitley Strieber's book, when he is in the chair and is being examined by the lady alien, and he says, you have no right. He manages to, like, cough that out, and she says, we do have a right. Like, what the fuck, dude? Yeah, yeah. no, you're right. That's a perfect data point for this column. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Let's then, let's maybe pivot to the NHI version of slow disclosure, um, mm. which is the idea that they may be encouraging us gently um, with a, a soft revelation of their existence and presence. Yeah, I guess would, this, this would be like an orchestrated, this would mean that they're kind of careful because they're like showing us a little ankle. They're just like taking it, you know? <laughs> One trip. Yeah. Out. This is pretty similar, I think, to the playful idea that they're teasing us out, um, which we assigned a four. But the idea that there might be some more more like orchestrated long term campaign, I would I think give a lower number two um because of the drop off in the last 20 years. I would actually maybe say like a two because of the lack of mass sightings in the cell phone era, which I think is probably not a coincidence. I think their tech is good enough that they probably are aware of our tech. And uh, if they wanted, well, yeah, we talked about if they wanted to, they could they could show up. But it's like the fact that there hasn't been a big show since before we all had cameras in our pockets kind of suggests to me that they're not increasing gradually yeah. their demonstration of abilities. I think that makes sense. You could, I think, if this were true, reasonably expect that it would be a linear revelation. And that's not really what we're seeing. Um, okay, cool. So let's just let's just move on. Let's call that a let's call that a two. Great. That the aliens are orchestrating slow disclosure of their own accord. Let's call that a two. Um, okay, so we touched on there briefly, this idea that maybe they're trying to tease out how capable we are of tracking and engaging with them, that maybe the way that they appear to us and play with our, or, you know, uh, uh, provoke our, our military um, is a test, is, is mm. doing data gathering. Mm -hmm. Like an example of that is Graves describes uh, people flying out of an Air Force base and just going right by one of these <laughs> circles with a box in it. Like, wh what what are you doing? You're just like hovering there waiting for a jet to go right by you. Mm -hmm. That's like demonstrative. You know, it could also be like foreign tech, but even foreign tech, you would expect to be sneakier. That's like weirdly blunt. Um, yeah. I don't think this is particularly likely because it just seems like they should be able to, there should be easier ways for them to gather this data than, you know, than orchestrating near misses in the skies consistently. And I feel like they could like gather information more, more easily. I don't know if they're so powerful that they can fly, you know, 200,000 miles an hour or whatever then they can probably easily tell what our capabilities are relative to them. Yeah, and they certainly wouldn't have to be out there every day, like Ryan Graves has said.
But I don't know. But like maybe yeah. a counter evidence to that is their consistent interest in nuclear facilities. You know, like maybe there is still, I don't know, maybe they do feel they need to be monitoring on like a, you know, m almost daily basis. So are you sort of calling this like recognizance, this theory, like they're, they're spying on our capabilities and that's why we see them a little bit or you're, you're going yeah, a little further and, and you're saying that part of their spying is attempting to provoke us to uh, uh, analyze our abilities. Yeah, that second one, right? I guess that second one. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Yeah. I guess it's a punch, but that feels kind of like a three to me, like not, not crazy. Um, but maybe yeah. not the single most likely. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm good with a three for the idea that they're teasing out, that they're like gently provoking us to learn more about us. But even that would then be nested within, like that doesn't fully explain why they're kind of careful, you know, then there's like a, then there's like a super idea over that, which is that, you know, something, which is they don't want to freak us out or they're getting ready to vaporize us or or they're mildly mildly concerned about our abilities right right there's got to be some other uh some some ex other explanation that goes hand in hand with that um okay what else well another dark one is this idea of a psychological technique that manipulates us that they're slightly careful because they're deliberately creeping us out um i don't love this one i don't think it's super likely but um People sometimes float this idea that like some of these beings in some way consume some negative response from us, like they eat our fear or whatever. I don't personally give that a ton of credence, but I guess I would also put it in the box of like, who freaking knows because it's so weird that it's hard for me to judge. Um, but yeah, they, so this just to clarify this idea, it would be that they're, they're not hiding completely because they want to freak us out. And uh, so they're, they're being a little bit visible because they want to keep us on edge and deliberately unsettle or disturb us. You know, that what that's making me think is that, you know, there's probably not one explanation for this. And there probably is some, there's probably some truth to, to a bunch of these. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. Mm. Yeah, that one is, that one is a little, I also don't put much stock in the, they eat fear um, idea. I, and I, I think I haven't, I haven't encountered this idea in great detail in a lot of places, but I don't think that there's a ton of evidence to support this in the way that we can, we can call evidence, uh, you know, we can call some of this other stuff evidence, I think. Mm. Like how they behave with our fighter jets or their interest in our nuclear facilities or the lack of mass sightings or mostly appearing at night, or sometimes the radar work, and sometimes they're on radar and sometimes they're not. Um, yeah, I would maybe also add to this pile that there's some negative evidence in that they're not creepier. Um, you could sort of, you could think of some ways for them to freak people out more, um, yeah. like ominously appearing above passenger jet craft and then disappearing, or like hovering over a house um, and or like shaking jet, the walls. Jetpack rocket pack people in brazil like <laughs> grabbing people off motorcycles or whatever that right was from last year which kind of nudges toward that idea you mentioned that like some of them might be like this that maybe maybe some of them enjoy freaking us out whether or not whether they like eat our fear or they're just like shitty alien teenagers who like freaking people out yeah. i don't know that's that's maybe not nowhere I would yeah. give this a two, I think, because I don't think we have a ton of evidence. Um, but I, I don't think we can write it off completely for all of the UFOs and beings that we've allegedly seen. Okay, yeah, I'm comfortable with a two for this. I do think your idea that there is really interesting that maybe they are, uh, they want us to be like a little scared that like even pre- a pre revealing themselves entirely they want to play some power games with us a little bit and be like just you know maybe, maybe you know we, we're gonna reveal ourselves to you eventually and like maybe pretty soon and in the meantime what we'd like is just some sort of atmospheric 
awe and fear. That's that's a really good way of framing it. And the two things that fell into that pocket quickly for me were one are the you the um the nuclear shutdown. Um, which could be just like reconnaissance, like th- maybe there are a few of these, but there's definitely one incident of a UFO, like appearing over a nuclear missile facility, spinning up the drives and then turning everything off and disappearing. I, I don't know. We don't know that the UFO was responsible for that, but um, it appears the machines turn on the like missiles start booting up and then they all power down and the ufo disappears um that could just be reconnaissance like they're checking out whether they could do it but as you sort of as you may it could also go to this other idea that you just raised that they're freaking us out or they're just like demonstrating who's boss a little bit like 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 a also like a wolf might do to a dog or another wolf like just demonstrating dominance in in a generally pretty gentle way i feel like i'm like i'm almost willing to call this another kind of hopeful scenario that they're actually being like kind of polite and caring by freaking us out gently yeah and also in this uh column the um the appearing around military installations like the graves description of just hovering there while jets go by i i think this is important enough that we should maybe split it apart um from the the psychological technique of eating fear so like freaking us out deliberately for fun um or kicks <laughs> or food uh that i would rate lower like maybe two but mm. gently demonstrating technological superiority that i would rate a little bit higher like maybe a four or even five yeah okay let's call it a two over four then two for eating fear and <laughs> four for just generally wanting to show us who's boss yeah, that sounds right to me. Um, okay, let's talk about the next one, which is they may try hard to stay unseen, but everyone makes mistakes sometimes. Yeah, uh, I wanted to flag the O'Hare incident in 06 as a good potential example of this uh, because it's so outside the normal box. The like, airport is like a very public place. There are a lot of people there. There's also a lot of like sensor equipment. There should have been good footage of this. Um, I think that allegedly there were some pictures, right? But like they've disappeared. So you can't find this paper trail on the internet, but you can read about the fact that it happened. Yeah, it's cool. It's so interesting. It's like it's you can file it alongside. It's it's one of the only public sightings that you can file alongside like aircraft carrier sightings because like an aircraft carrier, like the, it's appearing at a place where there is a tall building and a room full of people whose job it is to look at things in the sky and know what's in the sky all the time around yeah. that space. Um so and like unlike you know when they appear like an aircraft carrier or like buzz one of our fighter jets they're interacting with an organization that is secretive and has structures in place to uh to control information um whereas appearing in a public setting like an airport you're not you know you're not interacting with an entity that has controls like that in fact you're interacting with something that has like social media yeah which they might not necessarily know I uh, think they, they might not be able to tell the difference between our like military and commercial aviation technology. They probably would. They're yeah, probably easy. smart enough to know. So, okay. And there are also, so this idea that maybe their shit's breaking down, this is something that Grush has said. He said it in, as part of his congressional testimony when asked like, what's the deal? They fly a million billion miles and then they crash. And his response to that was like, yeah, we invented cars and we crash cars. So like shit happens. Um, yeah, and, I was and reading I, like Valet or Richard Dolan or just like if you read a lot of accounts, um, there are you do find a bunch where it's like it seemed like it was like it's spinning and it's sparking in the sky or it's mm. like crashed on the ground or it seems like they're working on it or mm. um, uh, there's a great story in the in Magonia. Um, I believe it's the airship wave of 18 Dickety Five uh, <laughs> there. <laughs> They like land and they're like, ah, we need they, like the airships there. A guy like belays off a rope, a, a you know, a human looking entity and asks a guy for water. And then he, or no, no, I'm sorry. I'm confusing it with the Italian pancake story also from Magonia. <laughs> it's just one of my favorite ones. The, the Italian looking aliens who land and ask for some water and then cook pancakes in a guy's front yard and then leave. So I don't know. 
maybe they were just making a little lunch and their their ship wasn't broken down but, but they're sorry i'm rambling but point is there are stories where it appears that ships are are on the fritz and i don't think mm. that all of them could fit neatly into this bag of maybe they're leaving these for us maybe they're crashing them mm. on purpose as breadcrumbs for us yeah, I think the sheer number of appearances argue in favor of occasional breakdowns being pretty believable. Like yes. if there are thousands of these events every year, then like, yeah, four or five of them might go wrong. Uh, the other thing I was going to flag on a human scale, I just watched Zero Dark Thirty for the first time. And, you know, the culmination of the Osama bin Laden attack is that we flew two stealth helicopters that were like experimental technology into Pakistan. And one of them just broke. <laughs> there are these like advanced cutting edge military tech and uh, one of them just stopped working. Um, yeah. So it's it happens to us. It could happen to them. And especially if thousands or millions of these events are taking place, um, then it's really not that crazy to imagine every now and then a mistake being made. And so like what I imagine might have happened in the O'Hare case is like maybe the stealth went on the fritz that day. And like for a little while, the shields went down and they just like whatever they're using to obscure visible sighting um, just malfunction. And uh, and maybe that, maybe that happens. Maybe they're often over major population centers, but they have really good stealth tech and like they go inside a little electromagnetism bubble and we just can't see them with our current instruments or with the naked eye. But then every now and then something just doesn't go quite right and we do get a sighting. What do you think about that? I, so I think, I think that it makes it, I think that's plausible and I think it makes it pretty hard to assign a rating to this one. Um, because we can't know how often their stuff is on the fritz and yeah, maybe they're all around us all the time. You know, it's like, maybe they can slip into the second dimension or something. And, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know. I'm kind of leaning high, maybe like three or so, four. I just don't see how it explains the behavior that we see them exhibit mm -hmm. though, like the way that they interact with our military and also the lack of the, the, it's not just the lack of mass sightings, it's the fact that there have been mass sightings and recently we're not seeing mass sightings. Yeah, no, you're right. It doesn't explain the intentionality. So maybe it's only a two for explaining uh, why they're kind of careful. It's like, I, for me, it's like a four in terms of just like believability. Yeah. Um, but in terms of explaining this question, it's yeah, maybe a two. Good I agree. Point. Okay. Um, okay, we've got a few left on our list here. How you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm looking at our few and I'm thinking maybe we do this like dark one and then the, uh, they're in a good order. The the dark, the weird, and then maybe the hopeful. Yeah. Um, cool. All right, cool. So the, the first dark one is that maybe they have a bargain with us or a bargain specifically with, you know, some military or intelligence leadership. And so what we would be imagining there is that they've made a deal whereby they keep their activities somewhat secret and we don't confront them hostily. Is that the idea? Yeah. The idea is that they have what the kind of careful behavior we're seeing is like as far as as much as they were willing to offer us in negotiations <laughs> that maybe they were like, you know, the humans were like opened with leave our fighter jets alone and the aliens were like okay you know we, we we won't crash into any of them we won't you know directly abduct pilots out of their you know f-18s or whatever but uh but like we're still gonna buzz your jets every now and then and you know and maybe it's even a maybe maybe this accounts for some of the weird could account for some of the weirdness or variance in the behavior is like that they're kind of like only loosely committed to this agreement that they made with us. Yeah, another idea that sort of gave rise to me, uh, to for me, is that maybe they would feel more comfortable interacting with military tech if they've made an agreement with what they perceive to be like the military organization and that they would steer clear of civilian mm -hmm. sightings as a result. Like, it's fair for us to watch your F-18s, but we won't check out Times Square. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i don't know this is another one that like ranks low for me because i want it not to be true yeah um me too i, can, I yeah. also it ranks low for me also because 
<clears throat> since they present as being so powerful, why would they even make a deal with us when clearly they're in the driver's seat? Yeah, it also probably doesn't explain the show, the the like showing us some ankle thing. Like it, hmm. it could explain why they weren't more public, but it doesn't explain why they are a little public. Does that make sense? Like, yeah right and that that's what i'm that's what i'm getting at with the like maybe it's so maybe there's a bargain and then maybe there's a bargain that they're not living up to or that they're like breaking the rules you know uh -huh. they have cheat days maybe or i'm just gonna go duck to just a few cow anuses <laughs> can't eat just one <laughs> Um, all right. Okay. So I don't know. Again, this is one that it's pretty hard to assign a, a thing to. So because like, you know, I'm no longer in the DIA. Uh, I <laughs> was. Uh, so I don't yeah, know. Two, two feels right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, the next one, I want you to share this one, but this was an episode of uh, who, whose idea was this? Was this Colm Kelleher's idea or no? This was this was John Michael Godier's idea from Event Horizon. Mm. Um, the idea oh. I've I've written this is maybe they're not rational actors, and we both really love this idea. Do you want to explain it? Yes. So Godier's idea is that these probes might have been self-replicating von Neumann probes, or some of them may have, uh, and they may have been copied millions or billions or gazillions of times. And in that copying, their code might have eroded and led to some behavioral hiccups, uh, which might result in some quirky, unpredictable behavior, uh, and therefore lead to sometimes visibility and sometimes sketchy sneakiness. What do you it's think? I think it's such a fun idea. I again, it's hard to assign a, a likely, likeliness quotient to this. My my instinct is like pretty low, though. Like two, one. Yeah, one. yeah, maybe maybe one. Maybe we give it the rare one because okay. uh, it has the same problem I think that indifference has, which is that you would expect if there were real randomness in the system, just more overall public sightings. Right. If they were really super fritzy. Yeah, they would fly right. over population centers more. Um, okay, one one just sort of sidebar or curveball I want to throw into here that is probably I just should have said right at the start is that our our priors here is that we're we are mapping human thought systems and points of view onto the phenomenon here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I read a, a great book about dogs. Um, unfortunately titled Inside of a Dog um, by Alexander Horowitz. Um, it's a really cool book uh, that takes like a scientific approach to a dog's brain and like, what, you know, um, and one of the things, one of the ideas in that is that like you should, it is, it is uh, misguided to try to assign human emotions to like a face that your dog makes. You know, you might think that it's happy or sleepy or nervous, but like that's based on how human faces move and like, we just can't we just can't presume that that's how they work so point being how, you know our our ability from this position to assess the motivations and value systems of these of these entities and craft is really really limited yeah i think that's a responsible caveat to make um but i would throw some lukewarm water on this general idea in this way, there are lots of life forms on Earth, uh, millions and millions, and we have observed some shared behaviors. They're not universal, and like different life forms have lots of divergent behavioral sets, but there are some things that almost everybody seems to do. We move toward food, we move toward energy sources, we tend to be driven by survival and reproduction. Um, and so the case there would be that life does tend to share some basic behaviors, and it's therefore not crazy to imagine that life from other places might share at least some of these behaviors. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I buy that. Um, all right, let's land on our last idea then here. Um, which is another hopeful one. Uh, and I'm going to start with the butterfly 
allegory and then turn it to you to do the the deeper exploration of this idea um i was talking to chat gpt about this butterfly allegory last night it's very it's like it's something that, it's a story that gets used to illustrate all sorts of different concepts it's one of those things that there isn't there isn't a single point of origin for it um mm. but the the idea the story goes something like you know a, uh one day a a boy finds a butterfly that is struggling to emerge from its cocoon and it's like almost out but not all the way out and so the boy in an attempt to help the butterfly tries to like nudge it gently out of the of the cocoon um thinking that he's helping but in so doing severs uh, a ligament that had not yet finished developing and now mm. the butterfly will will never be able to fly so that's the that's the sad uh, uh you know kind of entry to this um but you you take it from there okay i think that's really beautiful and uh, maybe if it's true or if, if if it's true that that applies to this situation it's cosmically beautiful that a, a human folklore metaphor could apply to beings from other galaxies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to draw again on this Whitley Strieber interview with Kelly Chase recently. And again, Rabbit Hole is an excellent podcast. You should go listen to it. And Whitley Strieber is uh, uh, an excellent commentator. He also has a podcast uh, and books that you should check out if you're interested in this space. Probably you did already if you're this deep in a UFO episode. So Strieber's uh, answer to this question, I've got a full quote here, is um, he says, they must be creating the secrecy because they could end it by just showing up. And he says he's communicated with them frequently over the years. And he says he's been back and forth with them many times about this and they don't want to show up. And he, he says, quote, the first reason is cultural colonization. We have to be farther along, and closer to where they are in terms of our understanding of the universe and our ability to manipulate its powers and materials before they show up. Otherwise, we're going to completely redirect our whole culture toward them. And then he uses the examples of the rare benign interactions between developed and undeveloped human nations and civilizations. Uh, and in the cases where that wasn't barbaric and horrible, uh, he suggests that what often happens is that the less developed parts of the human civilization reorient toward the more developed parts just to try to be more like them and get what they have. So this idea that he's proposing is that the visiting beings would like us to be cultural peers and they would like us to grow up on our own so that we can interact with them as an adult civilization, um, not influenced too much by them bounce it's, it back to you and see what you think oh god it's so it's so good and tasty and um hopeful again i think and avi loeb kind of touched on a similar idea at the very beginning of his talk at the soul foundation in uh uh last month what in 2023 i guess um which is that yeah that we're that once we find another intelligent species civilization that we're no longer alone in in the cosmos and that actually we have partnership in the cosmos and uh mm. yeah it's a it's a very warm and and hopeful idea and i think goes hand in hand with the or or can be filed alongside i guess the the psychological the like gentle kind psychological manipulation ideas that we've talked about and even the slow disclosure soft revelation mm -hmm. talked about. and i would maybe even propose that it could potentially in some way be compatible with the petri dish idea um this it which sort of feels like it's on the other end of the spectrum but it's possible that they're growing a friend <laughs> you know, like maybe they found us in the wild and they want to cultivate friendship or maybe they've been cultivating us as a species partially because they would like companionship man it's so interesting there's so much more we could we could say about this uh i'm sure we could like talk about this for another two hours um but let's assign a number to this one and and move on my I, again hard to assess and also my my heart wants it to be likely so like i really want this to be a, a four or a or a five 
Um, but I don't know that we have enough evidence for that. What do you think? Yeah, same, same. But four or five is is where I want to put it. Okay. Uh, and and maybe maybe desirous intuition is enough. Maybe sometimes love is okay. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's our YouTube show. Okay, let's call it a four then. Let's call it a four that they really want to be our friends, but they want us to develop and be ourselves. Okay. Um, well, I have one WT UFO outro, but would you like to zoom out and look back yeah. over this before we do that? Let's just say the ones that we assigned fours and fives to. Okay. The first one is playfulness. That maybe seems a little overweighted. I don't know. Uh, well, that's pretty similar to this cultural peer idea in a way. It's it's yeah. related to the positive vision of us working together someday. Yeah. Okay. So we can file those alongside each other. Um, psychological technique that helps them manipulate us in some way. Um, we assigned a four to that as well. Uh, to kind of like a power demonstration mm, mm -hmm. um, and that could be you could imagine a, a negative version of that of a like show us who's boss but you could also imagine a positive version of that that's like look what's possible um, mm -hmm. as a way to nudge our physics and our you know our thinking in a positive direction in a to like gently like incept you know an escalation of our scientific advancements Mm. It also sounds like setting healthy boundaries in some ways. Like it oh. could be how you re relate to a household pet, like you set clear lines for them, but it could also be how you relate to other people you respect. You tell them where your limits are and express your intent. Mm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. If we were to put the NHI and humans in a, a like relationship metaphor, I mm -hmm. think they're being like fairly abusive to us. <laughs> mm. I don't think it's great. I think it's gaslighty and and abusive. <laughs> but yeah, but we're conducting that, science. that metaphor doesn't really work because we're not on we're not peers with them exactly. Yeah, that's true. I should also maybe say there that Strieber went on in that interview to say he also thinks there's an element of their behavior toward us that suggests they're extracting something from us that we don't want to give them. And uh, he doesn't have any more specific information about that. But it it could be simultaneously true that they would like for us to develop into an independent civilization that they can relate with on a higher level. And also that, as you say, they're being a little bit abusive and extracting something uh, maybe above and beyond just conducting science to preserve our gene lines. Okay, and then that brings us to the last uh, idea that, that we have assigned a four or five to. We assigned a four to the idea that there might be some governing structure and set of rules that these NHI or entities have agreed to amongst themselves. And then we assigned a five to this idea of a, uh, that being kind of careful is a natural position. Mm. Yeah, that feels right to me uh, along the lines of the slight slight concern the risk mitigation the way we go on safari mm. that, that it just seems like one of those things that biological entities might tend to share as like an instinct for self-preservation mm -hmm. yeah alongside an instinct for expansion so right yeah the, you know uh cool okay all right well that was really fun I'm, i like this list a lot that was a really fun exercise um that was really fun really good question that you asked like pretty early in our journey here why are ufos kind of careful very good question interesting thank you um okay what was it that you wanted to to share with the class <laughs> okay, my WT UFO outro is from a Joe McGonagall interview with Sean Ryan, which is over six hours long. I'll put the link in the wow. place. Uh, wow. Yeah, it's it has a lot to do with uh, out of body experiences and uh, specifically using them as a tool for both spy craft and um, kind of like private detective work. Like uh, McGonagall describes his favorite applications of this spiritual technology 
being uh, rescuing missing kids. He rescued like a dozen kids in the course of his career. And, uh, and he also performed work for the intelligence agencies and the military that he sometimes was a little more sketchy about because he can't talk about this thing. But the, these, this guy wrote a book. Um, you can find that book. You can listen to this interview. And I, I'll include both the interview and the book. And I'll, I'll throw in a time code for this crazy thing that I'm about to say. Uh, which is kind of like near the end of the interview in the last in the, in the fourth hour of the six plus interview hour interview McGonagall describes a a remote viewing he did uh, that he didn't know at the time was of ancient Mars so the his handler handed him an envelope and basically the piece of paper inside said like Mars 1 million BC um, and you don't get to know that when you're remote viewing, you don't get to look at the paper. You just like target your psyche at the thing in the envelope and you come up with what you come up with. And what he came up with was um, structures on Mars, including a pyramid. Uh, and I should quickly say, I think they also tested him on some JPL images of current Mars. And he like accurately described some things that JPL has pictures of, um, which he then went later to JPL and confirmed. He like got those pictures and um, and confirmed that he had guessed correctly or described these things correctly. That doesn't necessarily confirm this next part, which is crazy, but I'm, that's why it's here in WTUFO. So he describes seeing a white pyramid that he feels is some kind of tomb that maybe was intended to be a, a a life sustaining building like a like a deep freeze chamber or something um but that it had run out of time and that the occupants inside had perished uh and he told the guy interviewing him that this must be some new technology because um as he understands pyramid structures it's very hard to have rooms in pyramids because of the physics of the weight um uh, and the guy says, never mind the tech. He, he also says at some point, the sun looks weird here. And the guy's like, I don't care about the sun. What's in the pyramid? <laughs> uh, the sun would look weird if it were Mars, um, which again, McGonagall doesn't know at this point. Anyway, a lot of buildup. It's a white pyramid. Beings in what was suspended animation, but that had now passed away. And he describes them as essentially looking like large humans, like 10 foot tall human-like creatures he doesn't describe them as alienish or grays he just says they they looked human but like large humans so that's a data point way out in who knows where a stand uh to support the idea of like i guess the petri dish theory um he could also maybe suggest that there's like some convergent evolutionary principle uh that leads life or life in this corner of the universe toward human-like beings um and maybe if you squint you don't have to have technology involved to to get like microbes from mars to earth which then tend to evolve into something like humans but it could also suggest that there was some civilization that predated our civilization on earth that lived in this solar system uh or at least visited uh and was fairly human looking so this is obviously full-on crazy town but i thought it would be fun to talk about and i'll direct people to the audio so they can hear it for themselves i mean that's that's great thank you for sharing that it's wild i don't really feel the urge to to try to add anything onto that story honestly what do cool. you do you want to you want to unpack it a little bit or should we just leave things there I think that's probably enough, given the gossamer nature of that information. It would right. be foolish to try to build scaffolding on and around it. Yeah. For now. So um, well, just put it on the shelf, as Kelly Chase says. Um, nice. Hold some space for that. Yeah. OK. All right. Great. Cool, man. Thank you so much. This was fun. Yeah, thanks a lot. Good conversation. All right. I'll see you next week. See you next time.